Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's SANS Threat Analysis Rundown. I'm Katie Nichols. I'm a certified instructor at SANS, and I'm so excited this month to be joined on the STAR live stream by my CTI Summit co-chairs, Rebecca Brown and Rick Holland. So if you have been with us before, you know, I'll often go over threat reports, but the plan for today is that if you weren't aware already, the SANS CTI Summit, one of my favorite events of the entire year, is next Monday and Tuesday, January 30th and 31st. And so it is totally free online. So anyone can register. I'll, uh, as we're talking, as usual, I'll drop some links in. You can register for this totally free. And we have thousands of people from around the world already registered. And one of the, the goals that we have for this summit is that we want it to be accessible to everyone. So we often are like, well, should we do some kind of introductory content? And that's the plan for today. Right? We're going to give you kind of a little CTI 101, talk about some of the talks and the agenda with a goal of really preparing anyone, regardless of your background, to be able to jump into this free online summit next week and get a ton of value out of it. So that's a plan for today. First off, wanted to uh, introduce my co-chairs. We've been working on putting this event together. Rebecca, do you want to say hi, a little bit about your background? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Katie, so much for letting us come in and crash your show um, uh, my name is Rebecca Brown. I am uh, one of the co-authors for SANS um, Forensics 578 the Cyber Threat Intelligence course. Um, I often work on the Cyber Threat Intelligence um, survey this year wonderfully with Katie, which is fantastic. And I'm also the co-author of um, Intelligence Driven Incident Response, um, which I wrote with Scott Roberts, um, who will also be at the summit, which will be fantastic. And you know, my background is in uh, threat intelligence in particular, and then I pivoted into um, incident response and digital forensics actually after my classic training in intelligence analysis. And the CTI Summit has always been one of my favorite places because you're bringing together people from all these different disciplines um, to learn together um, and to grow as a field. So I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Thanks, Becca. And Rick, how long have you been involved with the CTI Summit now? It's been more than, yeah, more I, than a few years. I won't yeah, I mean, years, though. Yeah, this is the 11th year of the summit. And um, at the time, I was a forest research analyst, and I remember uh, doing a webinar, webinar with Rob Lee and OG Rob Lee, and he was saying, hey, we're developing some threat intel content. I was like, well, it's good timing because I'm actually writing threat intelligence research uh, from a forester perspective. So I spoke at the first several and then became a, a co-chair and then have been with it as the event uh, has evolved. Um, I run um, the intelligence team with, at ReliaQuest, which is, uh, I came from Digital Shadows, so Digital Shadows got acquired by ReliaQuest over the summer, um, and then Forrester for about four and a half years, and then dating back further, I was in U.S. Army intelligence, so that's kind of what my intelligence background was. Nice. So a wealth of different experiences on the live stream today. Um, and I'm seeing we have folks joining us from around the world. I see Melanie is registered and so excited, so... Awesome. Melanie, hope to see you online. Um, we will have a Slack for everyone. So once you register for the online summit, you can join that Slack. You can kind of talk to people, right? I know we have people from all backgrounds. Maybe you're looking for a job. Maybe you're looking to get into CTI. So again, um, I dropped the link in to register for that. So let's dive in a little bit to our packed agenda for two days. We have talks in person. There are some talks that are going to be virtual as well. All the talks will be streamed for everyone though. Um, I will say one of the toughest things, if anyone's ever planned a conference, is figuring out a keynote. Every year, and like there's so many brilliant people, and we were, I forget, we were kind of brainstorming, and this person's name came to mind. So we are so excited. Uh, Chris Sanders. If you don't know Chris Sanders, you probably should. Um, you can check out his website, chrissanders.org. He runs an awesome um, training organization called Applied Network Defense. He also uh, founded this awesome charity, Rural Technology Fund, that tries to bring STEM education to rural areas. Um, and he is just a really all around smart guy, right? He talks about cybersecurity defense and intersection of cognitive psychology and education, right? So the keynote title, all about deconstructing the analyst mindset. Um, Becca, for people who are newer, right? I know this is an area you love as well. Like, okay, we're talking about cybersecurity. Why do we need to like think about analyst mindset, that topic? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is an area I also love learning about. I'm really excited uh, that Chris is going to be at the summit uh, to share all of this um, with us. And one of the most important things about cyber threat intelligence is the analyst. It is the person who is looking through all this information, um, you know, making analytic judgments, giving recommendations, sharing information with other folks throughout the security cycle. Um, and so a lot of it does come down to the analyst's brain and their processes and the way they think about things. Um, and one of the things that Chris, um, or Dr. Sanders, we should call him, oh, um, yeah. his dissertation <laughs> was how, you know, we find ourselves in um, this position where there's a, there's a skills gap in cybersecurity. Um, there is a need for more people. There is a need to train people more quickly. Um, but turns out, especially when it comes to cyber threat and intelligence, we don't have a lot of um, things to point people towards. Most people who are like fantastic expert analysts have done it their whole lives, cannot tell you really how they do analysis. They can point to models that'll be helpful, which we'll also talk a lot about throughout the summit. But Chris really dove into how do we better um, prepare people to be in the cybersecurity field? How do we prepare them to make these really important analytic judgments? Um, and what can we learn from um, neurobiology and, and cognitive psychology to really help make sure that people have all of the skills they need uh, to, to do this job and do it well. Yeah, Rick, your thoughts on kind of the analyst mindset, cognitive thinking, cognitive load, how do we bring that in? It almost got me in the middle of a sneeze, but it, it, it went away. Perfect um, timing. Yeah, it did. Uh, I mean, analysis is really, really key for any role in cybersecurity. And over the years of the summit, we've had We've typically had several talks each year. In fact, Chris has presented um, on the uh, analyst mindset in the past. And, you know, we're only as good as our analysis. We always want to avoid things like groupthink. You never want a threat intelligence team to all look the same. Uh, you don't want a threat intelligence team to have, uh, at some points in my career, we had a threat, commercial threat intelligence team that was all military people. And you you don't want that. So whatever whatever lens it is, you, you want to have as many different ones as possible because you don't want people to think the same. You don't want people to have the same backgrounds, religions, sexual orientation, whatever the case may be, because it results in a better intelligence product. One thing that actually ties in with Chris um, and, and also one of our keynote speakers over the years was, and, and I suspect a lot of folks will probably be familiar with the cuckoo's egg book um, and Cliff stole um, and Cliff did a keynote for us. I think it was five years ago. I, I don't remember the time with COVID. I can't, I can't remember, but it may have been five years ago. Um, but basically Chris did, uh, uh, maybe it was a 12 week, 13 week session where he did like the analyst mindset on that book. So it was almost like book club, but tied into, you know, how you do intrusion analysis, detection and response, which is really, really cool. And I'm, I'm pretty sure he still got it up as a, you know, archived on his site. But that's one of the best keynotes we've ever had at the conference. Yeah, I'm just pulling up links here. I'll, I'll drop the link in for everyone. Cliff Stoll's keynote a couple of years ago. That was actually my first CTI summit. So five years ago, 2018, that was my first one. And he like jumped on a table. And Rick, I didn't even think about the fact that like we're kind of connecting our two keynotes here. Um, I'll drop in the link. Yeah, Chris Sanders has a free cuckoo's egg training. Um, I linked to it in my blog with like introductory uh, CTI stuff. Let me bring it up here. Um, that's one thing about Chris is like he has, you know, you can buy his courses, but he also has a lot of free trials. And um, this is a free course, totally free. So I just dropped that in um, a link in comments for you all. So um, Chris Sanders, if you're not already excited, get excited. Um, his keynote is going to be awesome. And every time I hear him speak, I'm always kind of left pretty inspired. He's also a great person, as we all know, yeah. like he, run, he runs a nonprofit. He's a pit master, which uh, myself and several others in the CTI community kind of bond with him on. So he's just a great person in general. Yeah. For those of you out there who don't know what that means, it's a barbecue term. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you master, what are you talking about? Is that CTI? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have a couple questions. We got folks joining us. Some people, uh, someone else in Virginia here. Um, someone asked, how do I register for the summit? Is it free or do I have to pay? Good news. The online summit, totally free. I'll drop that link in for you. You can still uh, register online, totally free. 
Um, we also had a question a little bit earlier. How do you speak, right? How do you become a speaker at one of these SAN summits? Um, well, the good news is keep an eye out. I think there's a SANS Summit page. I couldn't find it quickly, but um, right, keep an eye out on the SANS Institute Twitter account um, on SANS.org. We will have um, requests for proposals, CFPs, call for proposals come out a couple more th months before each of the summits. So, of course, we finalize the agenda here for this one, but there are SANS summits all year long, um, and now they're online for free in addition to in person. So great opportunity to kind of get your name out there. So keep an eye out because there will be future opportunities or, hey, maybe you get inspired by watching the summit this year and then you submit next year. Um, we've had all kinds of speakers who are previous attendees and are now speakers. So great questions. Including Katie and I both. <laughs> this is true. Yeah, I guess so. It, it's wild. Yeah. And I, uh, I'll drop a link as well. Rebecca, right? Rebecca uh, was a keynote in a previous year as well. Was that last year? It was yeah. last year. Yes. Time the years just kind of run together, kind of also talking about like the analyst mindset systems thinking. So we have a lot of themes across the years. Yes. Actually, we, let me, uh, Becca, go ahead. I was going to promote a previous talk that you did as I well. No, I was just going to say one of the things I love both about, um, well, Cliff's keynote, I think, again, tops the charts. You really can't beat that. Um, but, but when I was able to keynote last year and what Chris is doing this year is really kicking off the summit um, with the nod to all of the different ways that um, people can learn, regardless of what your role is. Uh, it applies to individual analysts. It applies to people who are maybe students trying to think of what should I focus on. Um, it can apply to managers who are trying to understand, like, how can I give my teams the time and the space they need to, to think big um, and to, to do kind of their best work. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, I, I'm really looking forward to, to Chris's keynote to, to remind me of that as well. I think awesome. you'll, I think you'll always pick up nuggets and there's one from Becca that I quote all the time. I think she'll know what I want to talk about, but she was doing a talk several years before that, uh, around open source intelligence. And she had an analogy that it was free as in puppies. And I think that's just such a great thing. Someone gives you a puppy. There's nothing free about it. Potty training, food, crazy dog and things along those lines. So you attend the, the summit. If you're coming in person, or you're coming virtually, you know, take notes. There will be little nuggets that you can use and make you think about something differently. And anytime an open source, Hey, we're going to roll out our own MISP or you're going to roll out whatever your open source tool is. I'm like, Hey, you know, there's, there's a lot of resources required to make this successful. It's not just you get this technology and it's going to work. So you'll pick up nuggets that you'll be quoting. I don't know. This is probably four or five years later that I'm still quoting Becca on that one. That was like I love free life puppies. <laughs> is it that long? <laughs> uh, that's funny. Cool. Well, that is the keynote day one, but there are lots of other talks. Let's kind of hit on some of these others. So Sherman Chu is going to be after Chris and Sherman is um, a repeat speaker. He's had great talks in the past. He had gr a great one last year, I think, on current intelligence. And he's talking about this idea of consuming and producing. Um, and I wanted to kind of introduce this, like the other thing he mentions, this is a great breakdown for a lot of different tech orgs, right? There's the people you have, the processes you use, and the actual technology or tools. And so, right, those, we all have limitations, maybe in people, maybe in the tools we have. And the other concept Sherman's talking about is consuming versus producing. So Becca, this is something we actually talk about in 578. And I think you were the one who like explained this slide to me. So do you want to explain for like people who are like, what are you talking about with these two? Like, what are these two concepts? Yeah. So this actually, um, I'm sure, I'm sure it predates us, but the way it made its way into uh, forensics 578, um, was an argument that Robert Emley and I were having about the diamond model and its utility in analysis. And we were arguing, he was saying, of course, it's a key fundamental aspect of threat intelligence. Everyone should use it. I was saying, there's not enough time. It's too slow. It involves like too many different parts and, and no one can do it. And we realized we were actually talking about two different aspects. Rob was talking about going through and analyzing an intrusion, maybe after the fact, or analyzing several intrusions um, to look for those different connections or the different ways that actors were interacting with, you know, capabilities and infrastructure. Um, I was talking about the incident response portion, meaning there's an active investigation, someone needs your help, um, and is the diamond model the first tool you turn towards, or are there other things you can use? Um, and so that actually kind of got us starting to think about two different ways that we leverage intelligence. Um, you can be producing it, 
meaning you are kind of creating something that you intend to share out with others. And it's going to be what we used to call, you know, finalized intelligence in the intelligence community, or there's that quick triage where you're going through, you know, a quick OODA loop. Um, you need to know answers quickly so you can make decisions. Um, and that's more when you consume intelligence. Um, and so that's, I think that was how we started talking about it. And I'm actually really excited to see uh, Sherman's talk um, and hear how he's kind of taken this, this concept that came out of a um, two different analysts with different perspectives on things and how it's kind of grown and how he's made it more applicable to um, threat intelligence. Uh, so it's actually going to be driving decisions. Nice. Um, and I love the I'm diamond sure. model. I will just throw that out there. It's fantastic. And we've actually found really good ways to leverage it, even in a triage situation over the years. So we'll loop back to the diamond model. But Becca, you used another term, OODA loop. And this is one, Ryan Kovar, one of our advisory board members, he loves the OODA loop. Um, so if you're not familiar with the OODA loop, right, it stands for observe, orient, decide, act. And Becca, I think actually in your book, you, you have a lot of OODA loops. We, we do. We talk a lot about OODA loops there. Yeah. So just kind of a simple way that you can kind of break down how do you, right, make a decision? Like what's the cycle for either, you know, initially military campaigns or cybersecurity? You can also use it. So kind of a little yeah. analyst tool. And it was, it was initially designed for fighter pilots who have to make decisions like really, really fast. Mm -hmm. And it is really important that they can. Um, luckily, I feel like so, there's a little less stress on us as analysts when we're using it, but even in a high stress situation, um, you often need to make decisions really quickly. Um, for example, I clicked on a phishing link right before this webinar because they spoofed my husband, it's good times, and trying to figure out, oh no, what do I do? Do I shut down my laptop? Do I pull out a new laptop for the webinar? You have to be able to make these decisions quickly um, and going through that, like what happened? What context am I in? What should I do? Okay, do it, can be really important. Nice. So if you see the OODA loop or you hear OODA loop, that's what it is. You know, I think one of the challenges, we use so many acronyms and like people have been doing this for as long as like Becca and Rick, like we know what that is. So this is another thing, you know, as you sign up for the free online summit, we had a question, I'm a student. Can I sign up? Absolutely. But feel free, just ask. If someone uses an acronym, like just ask if you don't, if you don't know what it is. So now you know the OODA loop. I like it. Um, let's see, what else do we have? So um, Sherman's consuming and producing, right? Um, a talk I'm really excited about from Lena. Lena's at SecureWorks. I think she's gonna be joining us virtually. That's one of the benefits of kind of having a virtual hybrid event is we get people from all over the world. Um, so that's gonna be awesome. You know, one thing I like to note is, you know, for any kind of case study talks, right? About different groups or malware families, right? Like this Iranian group, Cobalt Mirage. Um, I always encourage folks, think about takeaways for you, right? Is this a group that might kind of target you or your industry? That's what we kind of talk about this idea of threat modeling is prioritizing the threats that are applicable to you or your organization, right? So there might be different takeaways. If you don't think that this Iranian group, Cobalt Mirage, is likely to target you, you still might get some takeaways on, hey, what, what are tactics, techniques, and procedures have they used? Um, so let's let's pivot into talking about the frameworks. Um, so we'll jump around here, but a lot of the talks, if you start reading the descriptions, right? This one on Linux analysis, cyber kill chain, diamonds model. And so let's talk about these frameworks. Becca mentioned one of them, the diamond model already. Um, Rick, these frameworks at a high level, right? We all talk about them every year at the CTI summit. Why frameworks? Like in your experience, why do people use these? Why do we talk about them so much? Because they enable analysis, not just an analysis, but they enable process and procedure as well. I mean, the kill chain, obviously, the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain uh, is one miter yeah. attack. Is, uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, um, they, they give us a way to think about things. They give us a way to structure the data and things that we observe in our networks you know, you know, uh, beyond the perimeter and things along those lines. Uh, one of the, in fact, I just got off a call with a customer. So uh, MITRE was a very, MITRE attack was a really relevant one, which shows uh, the, the TTPs, basically the things the threat actor is doing, and you're trying to map it to your ability to detect them and mitigate them. But they help us externalize our, our thoughts up the chain of command as well. And that's why I was talking to a CISO 
And they were wanting to look at the miter attack mappings of intrusions that they had in their environment, how well they had the control set up to mitigate against initial access or lateral movement, whatever the case may be. So another really nice thing, in addition to helping us do our analysis, group our thoughts, they can be a really good mechanism to communicate up the chain of command to be able to show what you're doing in the midst of an intrusion or to show how effective your controls are against maybe the Iranian actor is someone at the top of your threat model. And you want to know how well you're prepared to protect and defend against them. They really help us externalize our thoughts there as well. Yeah. And one of the things that we found is we're kind of walking through with all of the presenters crafting their presentations is like, Someone can share all of the great information about a threat group, what they do, but having some structure, right? It, it makes it so much more understandable. So you'll probably see many talks throughout the summit that use MITRE ATT&CK. Um, so if you're not familiar, I dropped that link in, right? Framework of different behaviors. I used to be on this MITRE ATT&CK team. A lot of people are familiar with this matrix, right? Across the top, it has these different tactics, which are the adversary's technical goals. Um, Rick mentioned a lot of them like lateral movements. So watch out for the in multiple presentations, right? They might mention these goals like an adversary moving laterally or persisting. Um, and then the techniques under each of those, right? How do they accomplish that goal? So um, this is kind of a common language and it's great for learning. If you know, you're watching the summit and you hear someone talking about, for example, PowerShell, like go to MITRE ATT&CK and if you've never heard of PowerShell before, that's okay, right? You have, don't have to know everything. This is a great learning tool. So that's one of our frameworks. Um, kind of Rick started mentioning the kill chain, which is sort of this, you know, stage by stage, step by step intrusion. Adversary does reconnaissance. They kind of learn about your environment, right? Then they deliver some kind of malware in, right? Then eventually moving to their actions on objectives when they start to do the really damaging stuff. So that's another, the second big framework. And the third big framework, I'll uh, punt over to Becca. You mentioned the diamond model. So I'll drop a link in to both of these pages. You mentioned in the concept of right consuming versus producing. What exactly is the diamond model? And I'll yes. uh, try so, to find the classic diagram of it. No, as, I, as you it's speak. in there. Right, read, I mean, if you have time, and there we go. Mo this is what most people know of the diamond model. And it looks pretty simple. Um, but there's an entire paper around it. It's a, a huge white paper um, written by some fantastic pages. folks. So if you're really interested and you really want to know how it can be fully leveraged and understand kind of why it is such a powerful tool, um, please read the whole paper. But um, the, the f I guess the foundation of the diamond model is um, looking at an assumption that actually a set of assumptions around how an adversary has to operate in order to achieve its goals. Um, its goals are usually to target a victim. And so how do they do that? Um, they have to leverage different capabilities. They have to use some sort of infrastructure um, to launch those capabilities against the victim. Um, they have to have some sort of motivation um, to, to target the victim to begin with. And so there are both tangible um, interactions between them, but also then I think they call it, was it something to do with metacognition or meta-analysis mm -hmm. between the different um the different axes as well. Um, so it really is a way just to map out and to think about what pieces you're missing um, and to either guide your um, guide your analysis, help you understand like, hey, uh, we know the infrastructure they're leveraging. Um, you know, we, we know this, the URL, you know, they were using in, in a phishing attack, um, but what was the actual capability? Was it, they're just trying to get a user to go to a page to enter in their credentials? Are they actually deploying some sort of malware via that URL? And so thinking about what are all of the different pieces and how do they connect to each other can really support analysis and really help analysts kind of make a breakthrough if they're stuck trying to figure out what's going on in any particular um, incident. Yeah, so another reference, I dropped the link to the Diamond Model paper in. Um, if you're a Star Wars fan, this is kind of a classic blog from the folks over at Threat Connect um, that might help you kind of comprehend a little a little more in a something you understand. <laughs> this is Star a good Wars recommendation. Person. Yeah, this is yeah. a good way to frame it's, it. It's a pretty good one. I think they, they had old t-shirts as well. but I have know. one. <laughs> You have one? You should wear it to the CTI Summit. Just so I think my wife has hijacked it and it's a sleeping shirt now. <laughs> we all need our sleeping shirts. But, right, the blog's still out there. And just kind of helping you understand, right, the victim, the Death Star, the adversary, maybe Luke Skywalker, right? So um, 
diamond model is something you'll see pop up. And I found that, right, it's one of those that, you know, people are like, oh, it looks really simple, but I think it's actually kind of, kind of interesting to try to deploy it and like use it. Um, funny enough, I, I go back to the MITRE TAC homepage. They actually just tweeted out the other uh, week, um, attack misunderstandings. And right, this is where I find people are like, oh, a diamond model is really simple. A lot of MITRE attack techniques actually fall under the capability feature of the diamond model. And so this recent tweet from them was kind of, you know, highlighting the fact, no notifications needed, um, highlighting the fact that, right, if you have overlap in like PowerShell and scheduled task techniques, it's not super unique, right? That would just under fall under the capability feature. Maybe if you also have overlap in like a command and control IP and you find it's targeting financial sector orgs and the victim feature, right? So I think a lot of people sort of lose sight of some of these models and like it becomes more about like, oh, we mapped a MITRE attack. No, hopefully you'll see throughout the summit, these are actually useful tools for analysts organizing information, right? Looking for overlaps, looking for gaps. Um, so I think you will you will hear about all of these frameworks. Um, I've got another one, Katie. I think yeah. we need to add to the list. I think Please we should do. have the pyramid of pain on here, and that would be a good one as a precursor to attack, right? Um, yep. For people to be familiar with heading into the event, especially because the author will be in attendance as well. Yeah, I was actually just thinking of that. Let me see which is the best. There's so many pyramid of pain graphics. I don't know which is the best one. Um, we'll bring up one of the links um, just so we can kind of talk about it. Um, let's see. There it is. So the author of this, David Bianco, um, he is SANS instructor, Forensics 572. He wants to explain the pyramid of pain. I can if you don't want to. I can. It, it It's very interesting because if you look at, especially you go back to your question about the years of the CTI summit, when we first came um, onto the CTI summit, even if you look at a, talk, a lot of the talks, they were at the bottom of this pyramid. And, and basically what it's saying is the higher up you go in the pyramid, the more difficult you make it for the adversary to accomplish what they're trying to achieve. I'd also say the higher you go up, the more difficult it is for defenders to try to detect adversary activity. But if you take a hash file, in fact, I've actually seen chat GBT stuff around mute, uh, polymorphic malware and things like that, but it's, it's trivial to change a hash value. And now your detection's out. It's trivial. I mean, IP addresses by their nature are ephemeral. So if an adversary is coming from an IP address, you know, you're going to need a whole lot more than that. Domains are a little bit better, but you can create as many domains as you want. And then you work your way up to the top. Now, the, the thing that's been really nice about the Pyramid of Pain <clears throat> is the TTPs. And it's almost like MITRE ATT&CK came in and really blew up that entire red section at the top. So people, because when this first came out, and I think David uh, Bianco, who authored it, would agree, people were confused by TTPs. What did it mean if you weren't doing threat hunting and, and, and living in that world? It wasn't apparently obvious to you. And so MITRE ATT&CK was really great because it externalized and exposed People were writing reports and mapping to MITRE ATT&CK so you could see, but guaranteed, you know, I haven't seen all the presentations for next week, but the Pyramid of Pain usually makes it up in almost any kind of blue team or even, possibly even any kind of red team talk that's out there. Um, I don't know if either you guys would add more color onto it or if there was something that I missed. No, I think the thing I would highlight is just a lot of people get confused. It's the pain to the adversary, right? Like what's painful for them to change um, so like, you know, I could probably register a new domain name with one hand on my phone when I'm talking to you, right? Those TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures, you can think of them as behaviors, right? That adversaries are human too. And it's really hard for them to change the behaviors, the things they do on the network. So that's what I would add about, about the pyramid. How about you, Becca? I would just also add that when it comes to inflicting pain on adversaries, um, more is better. So I don't want people to say like, oh, hashes and IPs and domains, like they're low and it's easier for them to change. So I'll just like give them a pass and yeah. not, no, make them change those things still. <laughs> pain <laughs> at every level, okay. cause pain at every level. Yes, yes, absolutely. Those, yeah. Everything's important. You hit, hit them with everything at once. <laughs> I think that's a great point. And, you know, I think throughout the summit, you'll see a lot of MITRE attack. I think that's kind of gained, you know, gained some recognition over the past couple of years. But I take the point, don't discount, right? We'll have some talks that'll certainly mention IP addresses, domain names, hash values. Those can be really useful as well, right? So I like the pain at all levels. I think that's a good takeaway. 
when, when we see this, I will, at the summit, I will, uh, I will think of pain at all levels. Every once in a while, the Marine in me comes out and I think that just happened. <laughs> yes. All right. So we hit attack, we hit diamond model, we hit kill chain briefly. Let's go back and see what else we've got. Um, this is a talk I'm really excited about from John Doyle. He's actually, um, an instructor for 578 as well. And he has some great, uh, content out there already about, right, creating career roadmaps, competencies in CTI. So I'll drop links to some of these. Um, John previously wrote about like breaking into CTI. So, right. I got a comment from someone in Scotland who's a student, right? Maybe some of you listening are trying to break into the CTI field. This would be a great blog post from John. And then he also wrote this white paper about right core analyst competencies that could definitely help you. And I think he'll probably map this out in his talk, right? Here are some of the things that if you want to be a CTI analyst or want to be a better CTI analyst to really focus on, right? And you know, I think regardless of where you are, trying to think about your career path and right, what are the areas you should kind of focus on um, would be would be solid. So I think that'll be a great talk, especially if you're kind of newer. Um, so on that topic, Rick, Becca, what thoughts do you have for folks on like if they're trying to get into CTI or right, trying to get that first CTI analyst position, what, what advice do you have for kind of getting into this field? Marines first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would say that one of the unique things that, well, it's, I say it's unique to CTI because I'm clearly biased. Um, but what I think one of the unique things is there are many ways that you can be effective in the CTI space. You can focus on different areas. You can kind of be a more broad um, CTI, you know, generalist. All of those things are fantastic. You're going to be most successful in a career that you are excited about and passionate about. And so one of the great things about coming or, you know, viewing the CTI Summit and the talks is it gives you an idea of which talks like spark that interest in your brain. You know, whether it's um, Lena's talk about, you know, targeting specific actors, or we have some great talks about fraud intelligence as well. Listening for what is most interesting to you and then starting to um, dive down a little bit more into that particular area. You know, take some of the tools, some of the resources that the speakers share and look into it a little bit more. Um, and then I think absolutely pivoting to um, something like John's um, blog post where he talks about, and now here, here, here are ways that you can prepare for the actual interview process and even the application process and how to get in. But if you bring that spark and if you know what you'd be excited to go to work to every day and do, that will really, really show up um, in those interviews. Nice. Rick, what would you add? Um, I, I think there's a really nice community. Of course, I'll as an Intel analyst, I should recognize my own bias, but I think we've created a really nice community at this event and more broadly in the, in the CTI space. So I think networking, um, and you don't have to be in person to do this, uh, right there. We, you're going to be in Slack channels. Uh, you can, you can interact with people. You know, I would either virtual or in person is meet as many people there. If there's a speaker that you like, uh, maybe don't hit them up the minute that they're done presenting. That may be tough, but follow up with them after the fact. I think most of the speakers would love to, you know, point you in the right direction and things like that. But if, if you're trying to break into the space, you know, unfortunately, a lot of companies say they have entry level CTI jobs that make it look like you need to be retired from the NSA to actually be able to get. <laughs> and that's on the companies that are hiring. That's that's their bad. But if you have a good network and build upon that, uh, I think that's good. Something else that you could do um, is, you know, be active on social, you know, start commenting on people's things on LinkedIn, which is kind of the, I guess the new Twitter in some ways, as far as a lot of uh, content out there. So yeah, engage with people on social media, put your own content out, you know, take a, take a step and write, write, write something. Um, but at the end of it, I think networking is really, really helpful. The best that you can do it. Yeah, and I was just bringing up, um, once you register for the online summit, you will um, eventually get access. There'll be a little button to join the CTI Summit Slack. And so some of the channels in there, there's like a general discussion. There's a question for speakers channel, summit resources, new to cyber, right? There's a channel specifically for like meant to be kind of a space that if you don't know what UDA means or TTP or what did that person just talk about, or if you have like a beginner question, right? That channel is specifically designed for people who are newer to this field. So that will be a great way to kind of network with others. There's a business card swap meet where you can kind of drop your LinkedIn. Um, I'm, I'm going to 
go down with a Twitter ship, Rick. Uh, LinkedIn is too hard for me. But um, regardless of what social network you use, I think the summit will be a great opportunity to network. Absolutely. Um, and you know what I would say in terms of getting into you know CTI as a career is that there's no one path in, right? A lot of people have a military background, but not everyone. Um, one of the my team members used to be a system administrator at a college, and he's so good because he understands how the systems work, right? Um, if you can get any kind of like entry level cy cybersecurity job, like as a SOC analyst, even if it's like a tier one SOC analyst overnight, right? Maybe you have time, go dive into some alert that you found, like be curious. Um, so, you know, I have heard from folks that, you know, they've watched a CTI summit, use a lot of the free resources that SANS and, you know, I've shared on my blog and others, and they've actually gotten CTI analyst jobs. So I can say, according to people who've messaged me, that it absolutely is possible. And that's really our goal is, you know, having this free and online, everyone can participate. All right, let's see what else we got. We got so many talks here. We're not going to get through all of them. Um, one that I wanted to uh, hit was from Sierra. So PwC is really a powerhouse in threat intel space. If you're not familiar with them, they write great reports. Um, and so this title, Lessons from Bletchley Park. Rick, what is Bletchley Park if, for the folks who aren't familiar? And then... Beck, I'll let you point out the kind of pun in this first sentence. Yeah, if, you, um, if you're if you a World War II history fan uh, or a signals intelligence fan, you might be familiar with it. Uh, there's a movie you may have also seen and not realized it was Bletchley Park called The Imitation Game. But essentially, Bletchley Park is, I don't know, it's maybe 45 minutes to an hour north of London by train. And it's essentially where in World War II, they were decoding Nazi ciphers through the uh, Enigma machines. Um, they would have antennas that were collecting information. They would have people on motorcycles, motorbikes, drive out, pull the data back, and then they would have these huts at Bletchley Park, which is basically a, a large manor type of thing. Um, and then they would try to decode them. Um, and basically, it's the, it's the home of... GCHQ, which is the the, the, the British uh, Signals Intelligence Agency, that then the NSA, of course, you know Americans will be familiar with that, grew into. So it's really like the home of signals intelligence. Um, and I've I've presented some World War II uh, talks at the CTI Summit in the past. So personally, I I love all of our speakers, every single one. But like the World War II geek in me is very interested in anything related to Bletchley Park and the lessons that we can learn at almost the birthplace of signals intelligence. Yeah, absolutely. I will just say that if anyone is in the US, they might still have them available. There was just a collector's edition stamps of women cryptographers of World War II. I'm assuming Rick also has a set of those. Um, but it, I, I love when we can look to our past um, as an industry to to learn lessons, to pull out kind of truths that remain consistent, and then also to point out what has changed, what things have changed, you know, since um, some of the early days of, of intelligence work, that maybe we can make sure that we are updating those mental models and updating um, the ways that we think about things. And yes, I did, uh, since Rick's explained it now, the pun will make a lot more sense. But if you look at the first, um, First line of this, it says the practice of intelligence can sometimes feel like an enigma. So that made me like laugh for a good five minutes. I totally um, missed that. So now you also understand the joke. Um, and that, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have this. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't understand that at first. Rebecca explained it to me. Don't feel silly if you didn't understand it at first. Um, so I, some other folks have heard of Bletchley Park. Got a comment from Kenny mentioning Alan Turing was also right involved in that. So yeah. Um, this will be an awesome talk. Now you know what Fletchley Park is. I love, yeah, talks that kind of bring in history. You know, I think one of the things that's cool about cyber threat intel is we bring in, right, traditional analysis concepts as well as, right, cybersecurity concepts. That cybersecurity is a little more new and recent than intelligence analysis, right? Um, so looking at um, Sierra's uh, abstract here, um, one of the things that she mentions is requirements, implementing requirements. And this is a term you're going to hear a lot. Rebecca, what would you tell folks is simply what is what is a requirement and why do people talk about them so much at the summit? So I'll give you my uh, thoughts and then I'll yeah. let Rick jump in because he loves requirements. Um, yeah. 
But requirements are essentially the guidelines for analysts as to what it is you are trying to provide insight on. Um, a lot of times we talk about intelligence for intelligence sake or intelligence that is like really, really fascinating and interesting to an individual. Um, but intelligence is really best when it can be applied and when it's useful to the people who are using it. And this goes back to the um, production and consumption um, processes that we were talking about before. You want to produce intelligence that others can consume and that they can use. And so that really does come down to identifying the requirements, what's needed, what um, what do decision makers, whether that is the a SOC analyst or your CEO, what do they need to know um, and how can you then go about getting that information to them? And Rick, jump in because I know I missed I, I missed important parts of that. I, I would just say be on the lookout for the term PIR, which is a military term, priority intelligence requirements. I actually don't like to use this term because most people don't know what it actually means. I just think, you know, what do the bosses want to know about the cyber threat landscape relative to your organization? What do the people in the security operations center need to know? And as an intelligent shop, we need to be producing intelligence that's going to be relevant to them. Uh, there's a number of talks over the years um, where we've talked about intelligence requirements. It's really important if you don't set it up from the start correctly, you know, you, you may not be successful in your endeavors, but uh, I'm, I'm sure PIR will make its way into the talk next week. And just think about that as like, that's a foundational level. What direction are we going? What questions do we need to answer? And how are we going to answer them? And then I'm going to throw another one out. You might not hear this this year. I'd be really happy if you do. But next year, I'm sure you will, because Rick, I'm going to pick your brain about it when we're together. Um, KIQs, key intelligence questions. Ah. So there have I've been been reading a book, um, Critical Thinking for Strategic Intelligence, and they talk about at the strategic level, um, thinking about terms and thinking about things in terms of key intelligence questions, which is really before you even know um, what the requirements might be, you need to know what you don't know and what you need to know. So there's a lot of a lot That's of cool. So again, always ask about acronyms because sometimes we just like discovered them last week and start using them. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have known that one prior to reading this book. Nice. I did not know it. <laughs> Drop that book in. I didn't, I was like key IQ. So, I mean, key intelligence questions, requirements, regardless of what you call them, it's just about knowing what you want to produce with intelligence, right? Or if you're consuming, right? Who do you want to support? Um, I realized that this, uh, someone of the abstracts also mentioned a concept we haven't talked about that goes really well with requirements, the intelligence cycle. How could we miss the oh, intelligence cycle? Yeah. So, Good old Wikipedia, right? As we're talking about requirements, right? Intelligence isn't just a finished report. It's also a process. And so we often use this intelligence cycle to talk about the different phases we go through as Intel analysts, right? So the requirements are your key intelligence questions. Often that's going to be up here in the planning and direction phase, right? That's where you're like, what do we actually want to do? What, right? What do we want to produce for intelligence? Right. And then the other phases, you collect data and information, you process it, you do some analysis, and then you eventually disseminate it to someone, right? For some decision to do something. So this is another kind of foundational concept that comes from kind of a traditional intel that you'll probably see. Cool. We haven't even talked, man, there's so many t concepts. I'm like, oh, there's just a few things. We'll just talk about <laughs> frameworks and, you know, it's a, lot, a few basics. Um, one other thing we haven't touched on that we've got to talk about here, mentions in Sierra's abstract, structured analytic techniques. Um, Rick, I believe you gave a talk on structured analytic techniques CTI summit uh, a couple of years ago. Do you want to explain what those are? And I'll try, try to bring up a link to that one. Sure, sure. Um, actually, there, at the New to Cyber, I did one there as well, a Marvel MCU themed um, talk. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you may have heard me say groupthink and not wanting to have everybody think the same way. There, in fact, I can look on my bookshelf and I can see it. I've got a book that probably a lot of Intel practitioners might have um, on structure and like techniques. But basically, SATs are tools that you can use to externalize your analysis, your key assumptions that you've made, and try to overcome any cognitive bias that we have. Every single one of us has a cognitive bias. 
you know, they may be not overt. It's just in the background because it's the way you were raised. You, you look at things a certain way, perhaps um, anchoring is a good example, right? You see the, the first decision you come to, you anchor on it and you don't look up for other alternatives that are out there. And so there's techniques that you can use to overcome that. Mirror imaging is another one. You might look at a threat actor through the lens of your own culture. I'm an American. I look at it the way an American would think, but I'm not maybe looking at it the way that an Iranian actor or a Chinese actor might think. So there's all these biases that are natural for us. Um, and basically you can apply, yep, that's the exact book. I'm just now looking down there. Um, you can apply these different techniques and there's hundreds of structured analytic techniques that you can try to overcome uh, your bias. And we actually do on our team, we do quarterly kind of, we call them hack days, but we'll take a structure analytic technique and we'll spend a couple hours with the whole team just breaking down a problem and using that technique. And then you'll write out, you know, the findings of whatever your exercise was that's there. Um, but yeah, there are a ton of them out there and it's really, really key. And some of them are quite lengthy and require they're they're complex, but also, you know, a SWOT, SWOT analysis, strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats. That's a structured analytic technique. Right. So they don't have to be some of the much more lengthy ones that I won't go into detail here um, that are out there. But really, it just helps you think better and, then and I question your assumptions. You say since you got this page up, Katie, where it says there's a newer edition of this item. I just got that newer edition um, and it's fantastic. They really do update things. They've included a lot of structured analytic techniques um, that are good against things like misinformation and disinformation. So I love this, and it's an example of how the field is kind of constantly evolving to keep up with new threats and maybe things that weren't top of mind 10 years ago are really front and center for a lot of people now. Um, a lot of the techniques are still valid. It's just using them differently and, and emphasizing when they can be helpful. Nice. And I've dropped a bunch of links, right? In addition to this one, this is, I describe this as like the advanced version. Um, one of my favorites, I have so many links up is this kind of simpler version. Um, this is a classic psychology of intelligence analysis, right, uh, by uh, analyst Richards Hoyer that lays out one of the more famous structured analytic techniques, analysis of competing hypotheses, ACH, which is probably the one that, uh, right, uh, Rick was alluding to. Um, it takes a long time. It's a little complex. Uh, I dropped the link into Rick's talk about ACH previously. Um, but this is a great one. I like this book because it's very accessible. There are diagrams. You can get a free PDF of it. Um, but yeah, just to emphasize kind of what Rick and Becca said, right? These structured techniques all about kind of limiting our cognitive biases. And um, I have this, you might notice it's on my wall behind me as well. This is something called the Cognitive Bias Codex. Um, I think it brings together like all these cognitive biases um, from Wikipedia and it just shows that our brains are subject to so many of these things, right? We notice when something's changed, we are drawn to details that confirm our existing beliefs. Um, that's one of my favorite cognitive biases, confirmation bias, right? Where you look for things that support your hypothesis. I always use the example of like, I think Maryland drivers are terrible. And so I selectively look for information that supports that. Um, so there's so many of these cognitive biases, and this is something you're also going to hear throughout the summit. Um, so again, you know, we can't possibly cover all of these, but if you hear someone mention, you know, anchoring confirmation bias, right. That's what they're talking about. Do either of you have a favorite cognitive bias? Is that a nerdy question? <laughs> no, I definitely have one. And I'm blanking on the name. Here, I'll describe what it is, Katie, and you can maybe tell okay. me what it is. Oh, this is a test. I'm scared. I, I really love when um, when patterns, when there's something cool that I could find in a pattern. Like, for example, if I'm looking at license plates, my brain tries to interpret whether or not it could be an acronym. And then I get really excited when I find one that works, whether or not it is actually that acronym. So it's like interest bias or something I can't yeah I mean it could be sort of a form of anchoring right like you know and this is kind of tying back to the like thinking about how we think right Becca you've talked about how we all have mental models yeah. and so like um actually license plate example the other day I was driving home and I saw a license plate that said UNC 5678 and I was like <laughs> oh. right that's an uncategorized cluster from Mandiant like 
it might just be random, but like this idea that like our brains have mental models or yeah. right things. So maybe that's sort of anchoring. It could be confirmation bias as well. So yeah. a lot of these biases Sometimes have the like Dunning Kruger effect and I, that rings a bell. I want to make sure that I'm not agreeing to the wrong thing, but I, I think that could be the one. That might be the one. We'll have to, we'll have to check that one. So yeah, lots of, lots of these cognitive biases. Um, and again, it's good to be aware of them so we can try to hedge against them. We can't eliminate them completely. Um, but that's something you'll, you'll hear about at the summit a lot, I'm sure. All right. We're coming up towards time. We've only hit like half the talks. Um, let's see what else. Um, you know, Joe Slowick, he is a repeat speaker. He's always amazing. You know, I would think about this talk in terms of one of the outcomes CTI can enable right? Enabling detection. Um, this is something my team does, enable detection engineering. So if that's kind of your jam, that'll be an awesome talk there. Um, we have a couple minutes. Let's talk. I kind of want to talk about writing. Um, so one of the things that I mentioned is cool is, you know, sometimes we'll have talks that kind of call back to previous uh, summits. Um, if you're interested at all in writing, I would encourage you to go back and watch this talk from Lenny Zeltzer, who is a SANS instructor, all about hacking the reader, right? We always think about like cybersecurity. We have to, uh, you know, know the bits and bytes, but we also know have to know, have to know how to write rather. Um, and what's so cool is this talk from Lenny. He gives like examples of writing, and then like before and after of how you can analyze it. So um, I'm really excited for this uh, this talk from John Grimm um, about right writing a good guide, a, a grimoire, is that how you say it? A book of magic that can magically tell you how to write. So um, thoughts on, on writing, Rick? That's, isn't that chat GPT now? Um, that's all we need, right? Chat GPT gives us everything we need. <laughs> yeah, of course. There's another historical talk, Christian, from probably two or three years before Lenny's um, that was really good on writing, right? You can do all this intelligence production, you gather the requirements, you know, the key questions I already forgot what Becca's uh, acronym was there. You, del you, you come up with all this great analysis, but then you can't deliver it in the right way to the audience. And then what was the, the point of everything that you just did? So if we can't write, um, and the thing I like about Lenny in particular, I mean, Lenny's a super technical guy. I mean, he teaches one of the most difficult SANS courses that are that's out there. He's not an intelligence analyst by trade, uh, but what he wrote really, really resonates. And you can have the technical writing and you need to nail that. And then you could have the strategic writing for, you know, uh, long term planning and the executives and you need to get that right as well. Yeah. And I just brought up this is the talk from Christian. There've been so many good talks over the years. So, right. You could fill like a master's course with all of these. So I dropped the link in and the links are available in comments to the stream. Those will be saved later as well. So you can go back. Um, but the main link you need to know, right. is for the CTI summit page. So we are hitting the top of the hour. Um, we've covered the frameworks. We've covered structure analytic techniques, cognitive biases. Um, we talked about PIRs. We mentioned, please ask questions. Becca, any uh, closing thoughts about the summit or what you kind of hope for it? No, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited just seeing how quickly the hour flew by um, just with you all and the folks were able to, to join us on the live stream. Like it's just making me very excited um, for the event. Uh, I think it's going to be fantastic. If you are brand new and you have time to look over some of these links that Katie shared, um, fantastic. If you don't, um, that's okay. Cause I bet you're going to get a lot more during the summit as well and come out with just a, a whole bunch of stuff that you can do, um, and, and view it to, to learn a lot more. Yep. Rick, closing thoughts on this, the 12th, 12th or 13th year of the summit. What'd you say? Uh, 11th year. 11th. Years are hard. Year. Yes, they are, especially with COVID in the mix. And now I'm just excited. I'm excited for, to see those that are going to be there in person. I'm excited to interact with those virtually. Um, just, you know, look at the, look at the agenda, find the talks that you're most interested in. If it's a, if a topic area you're not familiar with, maybe research some of the previous content the, uh, the speaker has put out and that'll help you maximize your time with the session. And then, as I said before, I think networking through the event and after the event will be really good for you. Absolutely. Well, we will leave it there. Rebecca Brown, Rick Holland, thank you so much for joining. Um, I just dropped the link in. Again, you can register for the CTI Summit totally free. It's next Monday and Tuesday, January 30th and 31st. We hope to see you in person or online. With that, that's all we have for this month's Star Livestream. 
Hope everyone has a great weekend and we hope to see you at the CTI summit on Monday. Take care. Bye-bye.